Welcome to the Driven by Purpose series at the Department of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of Georgia. I'm Brian Reber, I'm head of the department, and we're glad to have here with us today, Ruth Ann Harnish. And uh, our conversation is going to be driven by purpose, creating a fair, equitable, and inclusive world. Ruth Ann is an investor, as a philanth philanthropist, she invests in organizations and individuals advancing intersectional social justice. As a for-profit investor, she uses capital to power the people, products, and concepts shaping a fairer world for everyone. Ruth Ann's experience in television news and radio talk taught her the power of the story. She's put money into over 100 documentaries and feature films, expanding the notion of who gets to tell stories and what stories get told. She's the founder and president of the Harnish Foundation, celebrating 23 years of progressive grant making. Talking with her today are two students. Kate Lee is a graduating senior at the University of Georgia, majoring in public relations and political science. She's currently the director of Talking Dog Agency, a full service advertising and PR agency on campus. Outside of school, Kate's working as the communications director for a local activist and helping launch a PAC aimed at funding, educating, and uplifting minority leaders to run for elected office. Shruti Muruganadan is a rising senior here at the University of Georgia, majoring in advertising and marketing. She currently serves as the director of Fetch Research and Strategy at Talking Dog Agency. Shruti also spends her time working to provide a cross-cultural and inclusive campus experience for all UGA students through the International Student Life Department, as well as vol volunteering as a youth mentor in the neighboring Clark County School District. Before we start our conversation, we're going to watch a short video introducing the Harnish Foundation and its work. As a little girl in the 1950s, the no girls allowed signs were everywhere. It was clearly unfair for half of the population. The unfairness of the female experience was front and center. My first on-camera job was in Nashville, Tennessee at then WLAC-TV. I was the first woman that many young girls saw on television in a position of significance. And on the day the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated, I was the television news anchor announcing it. And I thought, we lost the battle, but we're going to win this war. The Harnish Foundation has a history of investing in big ideas, creative communities, and strong leaders. We're doing that through the fields of journalism, professional coaching, philanthropy itself, and we're concentrating on girls and women because we believe if you change the world for girls and women, you change society as a whole. When we empower girls and women, we help tap the talent that we need to solve the world's problems. We invest in the Sundance Women Filmmakers Initiative because we believe that empowering women to tell their stories, to be behind the camera, in front of it, will change the way women see themselves. The Harnish Foundation is a founding sponsor of BinderCon, a conference bringing together women writers to bring different voices to media. With the world-famous TED conferences, we created the Support TED Coaching and Mentorship Program for TED Fellows. It may seem like there's been a lot of progress in my lifetime, but if we continue at our current pace, it will take centuries for parity in Congress, in the Senate, on the movie screens, in the CEO suite. We are hoping to apply our money, our expertise, and our influence to speeding up that timetable. It's important for the Harnish Foundation to step up now and step up boldly. I don't think it'll be that far in the future before we can turn around and say, it wasn't fair and we fixed it.
Ruth Ann, thanks for being with us today and thanks for the great work you've been doing. Uh, I want to. I want to kick off the conversation. It's always weird for me to speak to colleges because I am a college dropout. But let us continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we are glad to have you here, and we're glad to have you talking to our college students and alumni and friends who tune into this uh, to this series. I have to say that looking at the video, there's some time that's passed between when the video was made and and now. So I'd like you, you to catch us up. Uh, tell, us, tell us what you've been doing and where you are now. And then I'm gonna pass the conversation over to Shruti and Kate. Thank you so very much for having me. It really is a privilege. I've been on campus. My youth was spent in Atlanta with University of Georgia graduates. I was steeped in the lore, and it always feels like I'm borrowing a homecoming when I have the opportunity to be with you. I don't know if people who are watching today would recognize the name Barbara Walters, but when I was a young person, she was the most famous female journalist, and she wrote a book many years ago called How to Talk to Practically Anybody About Practically Anything, I think it was. And she talked about how nervous she used to get coming into a room, even as a television personality. And I'll just tell tales out of school. People are hoping that this recording goes well it will be edited. Maybe this part will be edited out. <laughs> but Barbara would go into a room nervous, hoping things would go well. And she would say, I am who I am. I am my age. I know what I know. And that's all we can be and all we can bring. So who am I today? <laughs> It's certainly not the person with darker hair just a couple of years ago talking on that video. Who am I today? Certainly not that girl in her 20s who was a television news reporter or her 30s as a radio talk show host and newspaper columnist. In 99 days, <laughs> I'll be 71, I am my age. Who am I? Well, I guess we'll get to that. And <laughs> I know what I know. And one of the things I know that's my purpose is to be a truth teller and to get to the important stuff first, if I can, because what if I die in the middle of this? Have you contemplated your own death today? We are recording this at a time when over half a million Americans have lost their lives most unexpectedly. People of all ages, but certainly my age, have been forced to contemplate their mortality. Here's the truth from somebody who loves the truth directly. We're all going to die. I'm going to, you're going to, everyone you love is going to die. And yet we go around every day as if that is not the most important underlying fact of our lives. And who I am today, <laughs> Dr. Rever, is not the person I was. I could not have said, I am choosing what I am doing with what could be the last day of my life, the last hour of my life. The most important thing I decided and we've planned this for months, right? 
your Driven by Purpose series is well thought out and future planned. I made a future decision that this would be the most important thing I could do with my time in my life, knowing it could be the last thing I did. Each day that I prepped for it, I made that choice. And I invite anybody who's watching today, thinking about being driven by purpose, what is your purpose today? One of my purposes is to get to tomorrow. <laughs> And another is to really hope with you that you can embrace who you are, what your age is, and that you know what you know. You do. Everybody's an expert in something. That's a thing I know. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the things you want to talk about but if you'll let me tell you a little bit more about who I am, I just started finding out. A woman I know whose name is Lovey Ajay has written a new book and it's called Professional Troublemaker. And I relate to that. I resemble that remark. And she was giving an interview the other day in which she talked about creating an oriki. Do either of you know what an oriki is? Do, have any of you heard of this? I never had either. But it is a powerful way of stating who you are. And it, it starts with your name. And I started writing one. And I thought, if you really want to know who you're talking to today and what kind of questions I'm open to, I haven't finished it. I've just been scribbling it. I am Ruth Ann of the House of Harnish, first of her name, longtime seeker of truth, relisher of reality, wielder of wealth and wisdom, elder of her tribe, crusader for justice, warrior against white supremacy, enemy of the patriarchy. Maker of movies, financier of films, respecter of mortality, dismantler of systemic scams, coach of tens thousands. That I just got started. So that's who I am today. What a perfect, perfect uh, entrance to the conversation about purpose and uh, purpose in many ways. So I'm gonna duck out here and I'm going to turn the conversation over to you, three women. Thank you again. Thanks for being to with you. Us. Thanks to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rever. Um, it's an honor. I think I can speak for Kate as well. Like it's so such a privilege to get to have a conversation with you, Ruth Ann. Um, so I guess to kick us off, it's something Dr. Rubber mentioned in his bio of you is that philanthropy and being a philanthropist is something that you are engaging in now today. Um, and I wanted to ask in your own words, if you could define kind of what true and genuine philanthropy is um, and how, what it means to you. Shruti, that's perceptive because words mean different things to different people. I bet everybody here has had a different idea of what love meant. <laughs> Not always agreeing on the definition. And philanthropy is really love of one's fellow human in its purest definitions. You are caring about your fellow human. And the author, once said, love is the willingness to extend yourself for another's spiritual growth. I see philanthropy as a way of extending yourself for someone else's betterment, growth, survival, prosperity, education, whatever it is that can add value. That's how I see philanthropy. And it's not, you notice I did not mention money because 
a kind person is the truest philanthropist. When Oprah Winfrey did her last show, she said the through line is people saying, do you see me? Am I somebody to you? So a person who sees others really sees them, learns how to pronounce their name, asks where they came from, but not in a way that implies they don't belong there. <laughs> um, kindness, kindness is the greatest philanthropy. And if you've got some money to put behind it, that's pretty awesome. And I've made a business of philanthropy, but it's another systemic scam. Shall I go on? I mean, <laughs> rich white men made the laws that allowed people who accumulated wealth to shelter it from taxes in order to use it and control it for purposes that might benefit them just as well as those to whom they were supposedly offering benefit. Could have benefited both at the same time. Surely I benefit from my philanthropy. I, I'm well thought of. I have a lovely reputation as a generous person. And I always make it clear, a lot of my generosity is tax sheltered wealth. Elizabeth Warren just made a proposal today, and I think uh, Pramila Jayapal also was in on that, calling for a tax on the wealthiest of wealthy people. And they will, of course, fight it tooth and nail, but who better to cough up? I mean, the structural scams that allow people to accumulate great wealth. We're in trouble. Time for people to pay up. So all my generosity is part of a scam I'm trying to dismantle with the money that's tax sheltered. They, I think it's called using the master's tools to take down the master's house. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think we're gonna go on to the next question. Um, so since the Harnish Foundation was established in 98, uh, you mentioned there has been some time that has passed. And I was just wondering, how has your work and your views on diversity, equity, and inclusion shifted as time has passed or, or has it? So much, so much, because so much has changed in society. I was born in 1950. Women didn't even have the right to keep their own names when they married until the 1970s. It is almost impossible for a young woman of today or a young man or a young person of any gender or no gender to see right there, right there. In the 1950s, genders were binary and clear and Anything else was legally deviant. And if you just start from there, that I grew up at a time, I saw these with my own eyes, when there were restrooms marked colored and white, when there were different doors to enter for people of different races. I went to school at a school that had a boy's entrance and a girl's entrance, a public school. It was in, it was in stone above the entrance, chiseled in. I am still on mailings to this day, Mrs. My Husband's Name. Even if I made the gift they're acknowledging out of my own personal funds, Many times he still gets the thanks and the credit. It's amazing. But it was a lot worse when I was growing up. And so my first crusade was to have gender equality because that was affecting me from earliest childhood. 
earliest childhood than racial equality because I saw those restrooms and those doors. Then probably I opened to the need for more than tolerance of religion. I grew up in a very religious neighborhood that you, if you were Catholic, we knew where you lived by what parish you went to. And I went to the Presbyterian church at the corner of the street just for convenience, not because my family was a believing, praying, spiritual family. My mother's side, very Catholic, but Catholic and Protestant. The Protestants, I knew Lutherans and Methodists and Episcopal people. I met a couple of Jewish people in an extracurricular activity. This was like amazing. I came home announcing it. <laughs> I was so excited. I had heard about them. My father pointed everyone out on television. <laughs> so when I met people of other faiths, my eyes were opened to the fact that I might have been sold a bill of goods. <laughs> and the more people of other faiths I met, the more my mind and heart opened to the possibility that there can be more than one thing true at the same time. I met people and worked with people and learned about expanding consciousness of those whose bodies and minds did not fit conformist norms. We called them crippled kids. We called them retarded in the 1950s. We didn't know any better. There was, those things were in the names of the nonprofits that served those constituencies. Were they ever consulted? Heavens no. And now I love nothing about us without us. I, I'd love to tell you later about my latest investment in the nonprofit respect ability, which is yet one more way I'm funding inclusion. So I began to realize that we had defined disability by the way we built the world, that nobody has to be disabled if you build a world that accommodates whatever it is that is their difference. All of us are different. All of us are different. Anybody you think is normal, you just don't know very well yet. Everybody's different. And to expect conformity and that all bodies and brains would work the same is not a reasonable expectation. I want to talk about reasonable expectations later too. Then probably after disability, gender differences, running into people who didn't identify in the binary, hearing that that person who cut hair might be words that we don't use anymore. Nationalities, I never had that. I'm a first generation American. My people were called names and discriminated against. I don't have pierced ears because when the pierced ear fad started in the early 1960s and all my girlfriends were getting their ears pierced, my mother and my grandmother wept and begged me not to get my ears pierced because they covered their earlobes where they let their piercings grow back together because the surest sign that somebody was a filthy immigrant was those pierced ears on their women and children. And in honor of all the nasty names they were called and the fears they had for me 
I never pierced my ears. That's my daily reminder. So no, I didn't have to be made open to people of other nationalities. I, I am that. Oh, and when it comes to pronouns, I'm not picky about pronouns because my grandparents native language did not include the same kind of pronoun use that English has. And they were constantly mixed up on pronouns, him and her, his and hers, she, him, what? And, 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 and their language assigned gender to things like hair, I think, or a hairbrush. And hair was plural. They were, your hairs, they look nice today. That was the translation. I'm really easy about people using the wrong pronoun on me. Really easy. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not defined by it. I'm incredibly sensitive to use the pronouns people want. Just because it, it's not my sensitivity doesn't mean I don't honor it and want it for everybody to whom it is important. I know that. Who else are we having to be open to these days? Can, can you think of anybody I've left out? Trans people, I guess. Um, never an issue for me. Uh, I, I was a young person in Nashville, Tennessee, where there were many stage shows in Printer's Alley in which the most famous showgirl of all was not one. <laughs> so <laughs> never an issue for me. Who else is marginalized? I have, because I've grown to all of those. Can you think of anybody I've left out? Not at the moment, but I do have a follow-up question about, you know, as things have changed, um, how do you make sure that you're part of that change and not get stuck on one thing when time is moving forward? I read from many sources. I try to be in relation professionally as well as personally with people of many generations and different intersectional demographics. I beg to be corrected. If I am giving offense, I, I am not white tears anonymous here. I, I accept responsibility. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to teach others. That's my intention. I want to be held accountable for that. I don't want to be punished. I don't want to punish people. Well, some people. <laughs> I mean, if you have stormed the Capitol, I want to punish you. If you have suborned it, I want to punish you. Because all of our freedom depends on not doing things like that. Oh, so philanthropy? I have also listened to my husband after many years. He made all the money that I give away in large parcels. I was always generous with whatever money I had. And he knew that when he married me and he shouldn't have been surprised when I started writing the big checks. <laughs> but he always said, good business is the best philanthropy. Making a good job for somebody, giving somebody a chance to run a decent company, putting a good product in the world, solving the world's big problems for profit is the best philanthropy there is. I didn't believe him. Now I believe him. So I also consider some of my for-profit investments to be philanthropy. I am investing in women-led or minority-led or intersectionally-led companies, so, some that are really trying to solve bigger problems. The, 
uh, sustainability goals. So yeah, now part of my philanthropy is for-profit investing. And that includes the movies. Sometimes we put money in a movie for profit. I did recently in a World War II female spy thriller, fiction, but not fiction. It was based on real people by a woman director, writer, producer with a woman writing the music and a woman do everything. So whether I ever see a dime out of that investment, I think it was really important to tell a story of real women who did heroic work as spies in World War II and in paid for with their lives in some cases. So I put credits on women filmmakers. I gave them experience as well as something for their resume, on and on and on. And I'm proud that this high quality story is out there in the world. And every movie that's made is a small business while it's happening, has its own bank account, has its own payroll. It's a little city on the move. And I'm proud to invest in things like that, even if I don't make a dime. Please don't ask me for an investment in your film. <laughs> Oh, and one more thing about what else is philanthropy. This is what got me on it, politics. I used to say, I don't do politics. And I bet you know the moment that I realized politics had done me <laughs> and that it seemed like everything I had spent my entire life working to achieve, dignity for people, equality, equity and the patriarchal scams, it seemed we had enshrined these things instead. And so I realized then that I needed to put some of my capital to work in changing the political landscape. And that was the best form of philanthropy because what had all my philanthropy accomplished if it could be wiped out in one day? And that's what happened. So now I consider a very important part of my investment in a better world to be on the political landscape in nonprofits that recruit and train people, Sruti, we should talk, <laughs> that are doing things to prime the pipeline of available qualified women at every walk of life so that when vacancies in leadership occur, that an intersectional cadre is waiting to step in there and dare anybody to say they're not qualified or that they were a token or that we never did it this way before. That's philanthropy too. I think I am I think I might be driven by a little purpose here. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I think kind of continuing that line of conversation, um, you've been very open about the um, wealth that kind of backs the Harnish Foundation, the investments that you can make um, with that money. And I wanted to ask for those that kind of identify with um, the Harnish, Harnish Foundation's message of creating a more inclusive environment, um, creating change, doing good, um, but might not have kind of the financial capital or support if you have any sort of advice at succeeding in that right within their own communities, um, just kind of without the same level of, I guess, financial support. Oh, there is so much everyone can do at any level, at any level. If you have any spare time, what is your purpose? What would, what, the, the great donor activist, Tracy Gary, says, what would you most like to preserve? Or what would you most like to change? And then find those who are already engaged 
in that. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't start another nonprofit. Something's out there that's doing what you want. Find it. And ask what a volunteer could do with whatever time you have. Whatever financial support you can give, there's somebody for whom your single dollar makes a huge difference. Find others. I, I run a chapter of the Awesome Foundation in which people who didn't want to get into the legal bureaucracy of philanthropy decided to pitch their figure was, a, there were 10 friends, 100 bucks a month cash into an envelope and give it to somebody doing something to advance the cause of awesomeness in the world. <laughs> and I was in the middle of this huge legal foundation. You've got to fill it. It's a business. There's paperwork. You have to speak to accountants and lawyers. You have to make sure you're on the right side of the law as the last occupant of the White House was not and is forever forbidden from engaging in these activities in the future. Some of us respect the law and follow the law. And here was this band of renegades who said, eh, we don't need to be formal. We just want to give money to people who are doing wonderful things. And I said, how do I get in on that? So we started our own chapter of the Awesome Foundation. It's called Awesome Without Borders. And I didn't want to make anybody else put their money into it because I have money. So also, I could do it more often than once a month. So once a week, we give $1,000 to something that advances the cause of awesomeness in the world. And you'd be amazed what people are accomplishing for only a thousand bucks. Go to the Awesome Foundation website, awesomefoundation.org, or ours, awesomewithoutborders.org, and just take a look at what amazing things people are accomplishing with. And believe me, I think a thousand dollars is a lot of money, but philanthropically, it's not. It's, it's a miracle what people can accomplish. I didn't have money most of my life. So I'm especially appreciative of the fact that people can use your talents. I'm a calligrapher. One of the things I used to be able to do for charities was address their fancy envelopes because I can write beautifully. And people used to pay me to do their wedding envelopes. So it was a true gift to offer calligraphy for certificates and addressing things and lovely notes. I, I had a, a radio voice and I made phone calls on behalf of the charity to thank their donors. And you know, there are so many things you can do with just the time you have and the talents you have. My friend Nilifer Merchant wrote a book called Onlyness. And she said, only you stand in the place you stand on this earth. Only you have your genetics, your story, your unique physical self, your unique thoughts, the ecosystems you've surrounded yourself with. You're way more unique than fingerprints, which are way more alike than people have been led to believe. And we have not taken advantage of the onlyness of everyone. But I would truly recommend that you inventory your onlyness. What's different and special about you? Here's a really good game I've played at gatherings. You get a circle and a person stands in the middle and says something that's true for them and invites anybody for whom it is true also to step into the circle. What's the thing that if you said it, nobody would step in that circle? <laughs> that, that's you, that's just you. You have a lot of those things. And, and, and even if you have like a lot of the same things as a lot of other people, you're the only combo of that. 
you're the only mix of all of that. And that is that is not only worth something, that is worth everything. Uh, in my oriki that I, I was ranting earlier and I said coach of tens of thousands and one of the things that I really have to get those tens of thousands to understand is oh, you are amazing. I have never met anybody who comes to me who wants to be more and grow, who isn't already amazing in their onlyness. And when I took coach training, one of the most important things they said a coach could do was hold the mirror up and reflect the client to themselves. Because very few people see how great they are and how perfect they are in their imperfection. person who is not on this call who helped us set up the prep uh, was talking about the editing process and somebody who was on the prep call said they were glad that it would be seamless and edited at the end. And I didn't say it because I wanted to say it so you all could hear me. It's never going to be seamless and edited at the end in life. Life is messy. Life is unedited. Life is filled with imperfections, blindsides, surprises, both good and bad, every single day. I mean, I haven't looked at myself in the monitor, but it is a thing that has happened to me so many times that I almost expect it. I probably grown a zit or am blotchy or, or have got something on a tooth. And I won't know till this is all over and unfixable and no one has told me to get whatever it is. It doesn't matter. The things you spend all these times, all the brain space, worried about getting right and perfect and appearing uh, insta-face perfect, uh, it is truly a waste of time. It is a waste of your talent. It is a waste of purpose. If you have a purpose, Worrying about the small imperfections and appearing perfect, which no one is, trust me. I mean, I have had the privilege in my life of meeting and interviewing some of the most famous and important people on the planet. And they're all just people. And Jimmy Carter ran for president because when he had been a peanut farmer who against odds became governor of Georgia. And as governor of Georgia, I lived there when he was the governor, he met heads of state and captains of industry. And he said, they're all just people. <laughs> they're all, they're all humans with failings and flaws and, quirks and not, not only are they not perfect, some of them are actually not that great. And that's when he said, why shouldn't I run for president? I mean, I, I think he even wrote a book called Why Not the Best, uh, something to that effect. Like, why shouldn't I? And if you have been paying attention to what's been happening in our country, why shouldn't you? Whatever it is, whatever you thought your limitation was, why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you? People are in office right now who never thought of it until they thought of it. And then they found people had their back. 
Why shouldn't you? And don't try to pretend you're perfect. We know you're not. My brother used to tell me, if you can't hide it, feature it. And I have told that to hundreds of thousands of people. If you can't hide it, feature it. Women who used to be ashamed of being pregnant out of wedlock now pay for the privilege, by the way. That's another thing that's massively changed. We used to call children born out of wedlock. That was the polite way of describing them. We had words for them that weren't, you would not, I'm not even going to tell you what they were lest you accidentally use one. So now, if a woman has become pregnant without society's blessing in whatever the religious or social tradition demands, she can feature that. She can say, I am a single parent in her commercial to be elected. <laughs> she can say, my mother carried me across the border when I was three years old. We, instead of hiding, if you can't hide it, feature it. Say who you are, that Oriki. Who are you? What is your onlyness? Be that. Own your imperfection. I'm going to tell you that the day I embrace being crazy. My husband used to, whenever we were in disagreement, use the crazy word. You're crazy. And I would say, don't use that word. Because, first of all, it's very disrespectful to people with diagnosed situations that people have called crazy. And as one of my dearest said to me, the only difference between me and you is somebody charted the stuff I do. <laughs> and she's right, because we're all very chartable. You can write down the quirky, weird things. All of us do. So um, the crazy word was thrown at me again. I mean, we had an agreement. And I thought, hmm. In this instance, there is a possibility I am behaving like a crazy person and that that is not a wrong thing to do in this instance. Whereupon, I believe if memory serves, I turned around and said, yes, I am crazy. So I <laughs> and ever since then, I've been willing to embrace. You think I'm a B word? Okay. I'm a boss, B-word. Who you gonna leave me for, as Cardi B says? <laughs> you know? uh, I will embrace whatever it is you think I am and see where that rings true. I will see if I want to be that or if I need to take steps to change that. I'm not afraid of being told I'm wrong. I'm not afraid of being told I don't measure up, that I made a mistake. I used to be on television for money. People told me every day how fat, ugly, and stupid I was. Every day. <laughs> so, and apparently they hadn't even met my father. <laughs> really, it's okay not to be perfect. It makes you human. If you, were, if you are a believer that you were created divinely and you are in the image of your divinity, your divinity on purpose included flaws in the machine. On purpose, because they're there in everyone. Embrace them. They're part of who you are, what makes you only, can't hide it, feature it. And it's okay not to have an edited Photoshop life. Next. <laughs> well, you mentioned a little bit being on television and when you first entered into that industry, um, there's a video on the website that said it was incredibly male dominated. And we were just wondering, you know, how did that type of experience shape who you are today? 
You know, everything, everything shapes one. Being underestimated gives one a chance to perform under the radar until they don't see you coming. But being systemically held down is demoralizing and in my case made me a really angry person. From the time I was a child, I, I, you know, it made me angry. I, I work hard to diffuse anger that's inappropriate and some would say it's always inappropriate, but I wouldn't. I'm a, I'm a funder of the Alan V. Farrow four-part series running on HBO. Week two has passed as we are recording. I get so angry when adults abuse children. I get angry. I'm angry that children have to suffer because adults can't govern their behavior their tongues, you know, can't govern how they speak to children and harm them with their words. Can't grow up enough to be the adult and support and comfort and love that children need in appropriate ways. Can't help it, makes me angry. Shooting a jogger, we're, it's the Ahmad Aubrey anniversary time. Hunting down a person, and we still know you're breathing. These things kind of make me angry. I'd love to calm down, but it gets hard sometimes. <laughs> People on purpose who know better, trying to get people to believe self serving lies. I, th I don't understand it. It makes me so sad. It puzzles me. But it also makes me mad. I'm very angry about that. I, I try to put action where my anger is. Not simply be angry, but to, I believe... There, there's a quote from Gandhi that says something like, our anger transformed is a power that can change the world. And that's how I like to think of it. It's kind of fueling what I do. Purpose to eliminate the causes of unfairness that currently tempt me to anger. So I wanted to kind of ask a particular question related to kind of women who want to make their own path um, and start something, whether that's a new business or maybe um, kind of a career change. Do you have any advice? I know we talked a lot about embracing your onlyness and kind of it's okay to not be perfect, um, but it, for women that might have, might have to forge their own in their own way, do you have any sort of guiding words? Oh boy. <laughs> First, do that homework. Having a vision is great, but it's no match for having a plan and financing, and then a plan B and financing, <laughs> and then maybe a plan C and financing. Anybody who is thinking of starting their own enterprise now can look around and see, there's cheap real estate. You can get an office at way less than were market rates just a couple of years ago. There are many new businesses and opportunities that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Many big players have been knocked out of spaces. I'm a big fan of Professor Scott Galloway, who teaches business and writes books and does podcasts. And he encourages entrepreneurship 
but to be prepared to do it and to not go blindly, to know why you're in it and to recognize that you're your own boss. You get to set your own hours, all of them. You're going to be working all of them. It's all on you. Talk to other founders. Make sure you have a business that's viable. Never think you can do it alone. That was one of the big myths to overcome from the time I was raised. You find this when you are coping with people of my generation and maybe one or two below me. We believe in individual achievement. The, the, this one great man did it all. We're, we're still wanting to worship Jeff Bezos and Elon, the one great man. It, overlooking that they have a pyramid of people upon whom their success depends. Most of whom are being undervalued probably, certainly. Uh, there are stories galore at manufacturing and warehouses. The greatness is up there being subsidized down here. Nobody does things alone. Nobody is the only. So don't pretend you are. Look for your friends in the business. If your idea doesn't have friends, it's not much of an idea. If you can't get people to believe in you, to want to help you, to want to find friends and money for you, maybe you need to apprentice somewhere else and branch off. It's not always necessary to start your own thing from jump, especially if you don't have backup and you don't know what you're doing. We've all, and I will not name names, but we've all had people close who have come to us needing help with something that could have been avoidable. I think financial literacy and realism is the greatest gift you can give yourself at any age. Learning the game of money. I lecture on and coach on one's relationship with money more frequently than any other topic, except how to keep your parents from talking in your ear, even when they're nowhere near you. Uh, that's number one. But number two is money. And I would recommend that if you want to make the most of whatever you call money or your relationship to it, that you spend a little time writing your financial autobiography. Start answering some basic questions. What do I think about money? Who taught me about money? Who gets to have money? What's the most money I've ever had at one time? What's the least? When did I start earning money? How do I feel about different ways of earning money? Are there good ways to earn money? Bad ways to earn money? What if you don't have any money? What do you think of money for nothing? Do you think rich is better than not? Do you think there is virtue in poverty or simplicity as some religious do? Did your parents or other adults in your life give you messages about money, who has it, how to earn it, what's good, what you should do with it, how you should purchase things, what you should save, what you should spend, what you should invest? Invest? Did they ever mention invest? Did your family fight about money? Are you scared of money? Are you la, 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 la? about money? Do you want money but don't know how to get money? Do you have money and not know what to do with money? Does money scare you? Do you know money is made up? 
Have you heard of Bitcoin? I used to, in my workshops, say money is made up and people would, and I'd, now I have no problem telling people money is made up. All I have to do is say, have you heard of Bitcoin? And they all know we made that up. We made up Ethereum. We made a, up, name all the things. We made them up. We made up the dollar. We made up money. Go around the world and see how they made it up. I show and tell. I always bring at least a ten million dollar note with me. Zimbabwean currency is awesome. <laughs> How would you feel if you held something that said you had ten million? What are the crossroads events of money in your life? Have you ever had a money crisis? What did you do? Etc. Once you learn your money style, what your beliefs are about money, you'll start to see where you have been getting in your own way about money. I'm going to tell you an experience I had last, last year before everything shut down. I was at a business lunch with a person <clears throat> who was there in a new job in which moving money was part of the job. Talking to people who have it and getting them to put lots of it into the enterprise. And the person was comfortably talking about blah, 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 and said something that I said, Heh. I say that at my financial workshops. And she turned around and looked at me and said, it was you. And the person had been at a workshop I had given and testimony was had never raised any money, had not successfully raised any money for the enterprise that they were in at that time. And the next, I think it was week, it was so short that I, that I cried, raised a million dollars. All you have to change is your mind. The impossible has happened in the last five years. Things people never thought would be possible have happened. Can't rule out anything. Change your mind, change your frame, change your story, and you change everything. But first you have to know what your story is because you're telling it to yourself all the time, whether you are conscious of it or not. Same thing I said about the number one thing in coaching is getting people to recognize that all the pressure they feel is really the voice of mom or the voice of dad telling them what they should or shouldn't or can or can't do, that they feel limited or driven or guilty or inadequate in some way because of a voice that's not their own. So your most important job is to figure out what is your voice? What do I really think based on, please, facts, provable? Can you prove it? Are you absolutely sure you can prove it? Not somebody told me, not I heard. Can you prove it? That was part of what my journalism training was about. And interestingly, the, I don't even know what she calls herself, so I'll call herself her author, workshopper, Byron Katie, works with people and does a process she calls the work. Because she says people are largely unhappy because of the stories they're making up in their heads all the time, telling themselves stories. They just get one thing and go wild up there. And most people understand if I say, think about the stories 
that you ever told yourself about why that phone didn't ring. <laughs> the stories you made up about why the person didn't call or hadn't called yet or what would happen when the call came. We make up so many stories and her work invites you to ask, is that really true? Can you prove it's true? And then, who would you be if it wasn't true? So maybe you're making up your limits. Maybe you're making up a truth that somebody's trying to get across to you. That's not backed up by facts. I love reality. Alan Alda, actor, podcaster, writes about conversation has his philanthropy includes uh, creating a center that teaches scientists, including doctors, how to communicate effectively with the public. That all the science and all the medicine in the world is worthless if we have no idea what they're saying, or if they don't know how to say it comfortably, or if they are not good with the truth. I mean, Sometimes they can be traumatic when delivering truth. So I love his philanthropy. But his philosophy about a conversation is you should not consider it a conversation unless you are willing to be changed by what's said. And I try to be willing to be changed by what's said to me anytime I hear it. But I have to make sure that it rings true and is provable, or the preponderance of evidence is there. Oprah used to end her, I haven't read it in years. I used to work with Oprah. You can probably Google that on the internet. But she used to end her, mag, her magazine by with what I know for sure. And I always laugh at the one thing I know for sure is I don't know anything for sure. I for sure don't know anything today that I'm absolutely sure will be true by the time anybody hears this who's not hearing it right now. And I may even disagree with myself. Dan, I want to ask, you know, what are you passionate about right now? <laughs> What's a project that's just on your mind and you're thinking about it constantly? I will answer you truthfully. I am devoting this year to preparing for my inevitable death. My life is not ready for me to die. I am in the process of taking courses that familiarize me with estate planning for people who are in my position. I grew up, they told me middle class, but I know now, good luck, that was not middle class. <laughs> and I've been bankrupt. I have been hand to mouth right up until, you know, the last half of my life. The, actually, just the last couple decades, I am still learning how to be an extremely good steward of my wealth in life as well as in death. If you have ever had to clean up someone's estate, and I have more than one, have mercy on the people who will come behind you. Do not leave things in a state that will make your death a true disruption in their lives that it does not have to be. Jewish people say, may his memory be a blessing. May her memory be a blessing. And I tell you, a memory of some people in my life is a blessing, but compounded with, holy cow, I had to spend half a year cleaning up the mess you left me. Legally speaking, property-wise, you left me to make decisions you should have made. And I don't want any, I mean, really, I hope I don't die before I do this. 
I am working on all the legalities and I'm educating myself so that I don't say, well, I just did what they told me because I've learned bankers don't always bother to know who you really are and what you want. <laughs> I have a banker through whom a small fortune has gone in accounts through the many years I've been part of that banker's portfolio who called me Ruth, not for the first time, not even for the hundredth time, probably. Every time I say, it's Ruth Ann. And I can see her colleagues on the Zoom trying not to go <laughs> because it happens every time. I'm not going to trust that person on the details of disposing of what I have if my name is too much to get right. So I'm taking personal responsibility for knowing what the laws are, what some of the loopholes are, and where it works best for me because I. I'm the only one of me. What, what's Taylor Swift? I'm the only one of me. Baby, that's the fun of me. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth Ann, for such a wonderful master class in, in all things purpose, in, in, in talking about equity and inclusion, in talking about uh, the, 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 the kind of personal empowerment that is so important to to all of us, and uh, we, we really appreciate you being with us today. And Shruti and Kate, thank you for uh, your wonderful questions. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm eager, in fact, I've got tidbits that I wanna share with my colleagues right after we finish. Uh, and I know that, that you're going to share these with your uh, friends and colleagues as well. We look forward to, uh, to more conversations, I hope, Ruth Ann. And, uh, and in, until then, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you for joining us for this Driven by Purpose session. In our April session will be uh, Randall Jones. Randall is chairman and CEO of American Idea Lab and founder of Worth Magazine. So watch for, for our next session on Driven by Purpose. And for today, thank you so much for joining us.